Good everyone. Why don't I, I'm just uh, going to pray first uh, and then me uh, uh, to everyone. Me uh, to everyone. Nei mā tau e nō i hui hui ai, ki a tuku atu nei te whakamui me tiaki nei ki a koe, ko tau tama nei te tirangatiratanga nei i runi a mātou i tēnei rā, i runi i tēnei whenua, i runi i te kaupapa nei o te rā, e a ka papa te whaitiri, ka hiko hiko te wira o tō reo, i rotu i te ahuatanga nei o tēnei ata. Nō reira rā i rotu i te rā, ka e nō i nō i atu rā ki a koe, I rutu i te ngoa tapu nei, o tō tau eriki nei, i hukraiti mua ke tunu atu. Amene. Nō reiri rā, i rutu i tērā, nui atu nā te mihi rā, kia koutou, ki te haungkāenga, kia koutou rā, o te nā hunga, te hunga whakapono, me te whānau, nā iwi nā hapu katoa nei, kua hui hui mai nei ki konei. So I just want to welcome everyone to this session. Um, it's a little bit intimidating <laughs> to be uh, last up, maybe. Um, and, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Alistair and I will uh, convey the message we feel God has told us to tell you today. And so um, I'll just kick into it and you'll get to know who I am and uh, my views and uh, where I come from as I talk Kei so this is a, um, how would I call it, a, a, a whakapapa, whakapono. This is my, our own family genealogy of the pathways of Christianity into our lineage. And so uh, my, there's me at the bottom there, you can see my father on the right, or my right hand side, and my mother. And my mother's side, if you look up, you'll see she has a lineage from Matatua. And most of our tribes from that region in Whakatane, where I live, they actually took on uh, the Katorika, Catholic faith, in that region. Also, very strong Ringatū. Uh, part of our, that's why we have uh, Tekoti, I have Tekoti there. Part of our lineage, actually, our family lineage comes off his father's siblings, down into Ngātiawa. And so Ringatū is very strong in that area. Um, we have in our lineage part of a connection, very strong connection to Mahia Peninsula, uh, to the whānau of Toyora, or Te Toiroa. And uh, in that lineage, they were very strong mihingare. Many of our whānau became um, uh, Mormons and uh, in that field. Uh, Takapo, my grandfather's side, is from the, the region of the Takapo Plains, just south of Teote College and uh, the Danivirk region, and they were strong mihingare. Uh, they also went with whatever was going on at the time. Uh, Ringatū, Ratana, everyone would go to the Ratana meetings, uh, and uh, so whatever was going on that had the most power at the time, they were moving that way. Um, in our South Island lineage down at Ruapoke, Ruapoke Island, Muiraki, down in those regions, uh, they were Lutherans, they were Catholics, they were Anglicans, they were Wesleyans, they're whatever you think came to the land is down there. And for some reason, we all went to all of them. Okay? <laughs> On my father's line, they come from Tuwharetua, but more up the Whangaehu River to Kawangaroa, which is uh, a, actually a Ringatū stronghold there which became very strongly aligned to Ratana. So I'm, I suppose I could say I can speak to any Christianity in New Zealand because it's all in my hands, right? Uh, but some of our families, we progressed to the more charismatic realms and, uh, <laughs> and came to the truth of Pentecostalism. We haven't quite been uh, asked to kind of revert back to mihingara yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what I would like to do is, uh, well, maybe I'm talking about mihingari now, uh, is um, I want to revert to my takapo side. 
uh, which is uh, my grandfather's side, um, because when Sam asked me to speak, I, I was trying to work out what should I speak about. So I labelled this talk from Pai here, from here, to a place called Puehutai. And Puehutai is uh, down past Danivuk on the Manawatu River. And I will get to that in a minute. So we come from this place, uh, which is called a, a range of hills called Nakai Hinaki A Fata. And Fata was a, a grandson, or depends which lineage you're going on, or great grandson of Paikia. And they had a bit of a war, him and a guy called Tongofiti. Tongofiti was a, uh, a grandson or great grandson of a guy called Nuku Toya, who was a brother to Kupe. This is, our, this is what we say, and what we say is our truth. And uh, they had a, a bit of a, 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 not an argument, they had a war of prayers over the, the Fatuma Lake for who would have first dibs on the eels in that region. And uh, that's why it's called Whakapau Karakia. So you, you guys have this name in Hokianga, Whakapau Karakia, Exactly the same idea was here in Takapo. Uh, the central mountain in the middle of this picture is called Hore, uh, Hore Hore. And whenever our families go there, we climb that mountain uh, to, I don't know, reinvigorate it ourselves to make sure we know and teach our kids this is the central place where our ancestors lived. It's called Te Pa Hore Hore. It's usually the place, uh, or Te Hira will know, uh, where uh, Dr. Peter Sharples took their kapahaka team for years up that hill to uh, learn the arts of kapahaka, well, of uh, tutaua, te whare tutaua. And uh, that is this place here. Our family are very strong related to this place. Um, the genealogy of this place, our connection comes from a woman called Te Opekai. This, uh, her name is here, Te Opekai. She was part of a... a uh, a, a team or a group of high-born women that were re-established back on that hill uh, for their mana. She had a daughter, Te Iwi Kaingata, uh, and uh, her husband was a man called Tuhunga Aio. And they had uh, three children in the blue, Nahoka, uh, Te Wao, and uh, Whangataua. And uh, Nahoka came down, had a, a child called Porto, who had Ataneta, is where the Paiwai family in Danivirk come from. So I mentioned this in my Fai Corridor, because Dr. Paiwai lived here as a doctor for this region. Uh, Nahoka had a sister called Te Wao, who was killed in a battle, and uh, her brother Whangataua, which is where our whanau come from, went to war for the death of his sister. And uh, anyway, Whangataua, is uh, the second brother in this family. He had a son called Maka. That son had, uh, had a son called Aritaku. Uh, Maka's wife, Miriamma, was uh, baptized by Kalenzo. Her father was a man called Hakaraya. He was the guy that told Kalenzo about Cape Kidnappers and the situation with when Captain Cook came and these Maoris came to kidnap the son of Tupaya. It was from this man, Hakaraya. His full name is Narangi uh, Kamo. And this son is Aritaku. Uh, Aritaku was born in a cave. His name means Aristarchus. Who knows Aristarchus? In He's in the Bible. He's uh, mentioned probably two times as a high counselor of Macedonia who followed Paul into prison in Rome, and died there. So these Māoris are reading the scriptures hard, and they're naming their children after obscure characters in the genealogy of the Bible, <laughs> just to make sure that we know what we're talking about. And, they, and uh, then had my grandfather uh, Golan, uh, or Korana, and, uh, who had my mother, who had me. The reason I mention this lineage, because it's about me, uh, but it's about what I put the, the people named in blue were the first line ancestors who met the narrative of the gospel. And it was Colenso who brought it to them. And uh, I actually want to talk about 
this generation? How did they, how did Colenso meet them? And what was it that turned their allegiance to another God? Because this is the main question our young people today are asking. And if we can't answer it, then they ain't listening. Okay? So these images are just some of our whānau. The guy in the top uh, left to you, uh, Marka Whangatoa, he's the son of this man Whangatoa, who I want to follow. Next to him is his uh, son Aritaku and his, his daughter Terina. Uh, the queer who has got the battle axe in her hand. <laughs> she was married to Purako, and they were the editors of Te Poke Kihukurangi, the famous newspaper from Wairarapa. And uh, they had no children, but they whangaid many people from the Wairarapa in, in the, in the, uh, under their uh, mana. Um, down on the left is a generation in the 1920s, 30s of my grandfather's era, of this family that lived in Takapo. And then the colour photo there, that's a number of us that gathered recently, last year in a family gathering uh, in, uh, Tanif- in uh, where were we, Takapo. And what happened was, I'll go back, we went to a family reunion last year with the Paiwai family, the Marka family and the Paiwai family. Because these two guys, Nahoka, you can see on the genealogy, and his, his young brother, Whangatoa, decided to have a fight, a sibling rivalry, and they left each other, never spoke to each other ever again. The the older brother lived in Tahoraiti, which is near south of Danivik, in that region. The older brother, the young brother, Whangatoa, left and went up into the the forests in Takapo. And we've been separated for 200 years. And we decided because we were gathering that we would go and see this family and formally reunite. So this is part of the imagery of that day. Last year, uh, we had a boulder of greenstone and we went as a whānau and laid it down before the Paiwai family and we called this stone Te Rongo o Whangatauwa. Now all of us as Christians... We are called to the ministry of reconciliation, right? So we have to create environments where that can happen in our tribal communities, in our family communities, in our church communities, wherever. So my mind is tick, 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 trying to work out, now how can I use this situation? Well, this situation came up. This young uh, nephew of mine had a boulder of greenstone in his uh, boot for some reason. Uh, <laughs> We won't find out why, why he's got that happening. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, we can use this. We can't just go and meet this family without some kind of uh, crossing of the threshold. And so my uncle laid the stone down. We called it the piece of Whangatauwa, which is kind of unusual because this ancestor named Whangatauwa, his name means to wait in battle. Whanga, lie and wait. Tauwa is a war party. Basically, his name means ambush. And I think part of our family kind of hold that, uh, you know, aptitude about ambush. Okay? So we lay the stone down after 200 years of separation, prayed together, and became one family again. This was only last year. Right? And, uh, man, we made T-shirts about it, and it went right around the Rangitania region, Janivik, this conversation about these types of ceremonies they hadn't seen for a long time. Okay? And then the family took us to this place. We drove through these hills to this landscape. We're on a hill, looking down to the Manawatu River, the bend there, and you can see the red pencil mark I put there is the location of a place called Puehutai. And Puehutai is a village that on Kalenzo's journeys, he went and called in there a lot. Okay? And then we drove down to, uh, here it is on, this is uh, a map out of um, Ian St. George's uh, uh, books of his, uh, on Kalenzo's journey. And the, the round uh, uh, marks represent the villages along this particular route 
that uh, Colenso actually visited. And you can see uh, uh, Daniverk there, and along the rivers, Hototara, and then below, in, I've put in yellow, is Puehutai, and then he would continue down to O Tafao, O Tawao, Na Awapurua, which is near Woodville, and then down into the uh, Wairarapa. And so we were taken to this village called Puehutai. Um, and Manahi Paiwai spoke to us about this place. And most of us had little idea about this place at all, except for maybe two or three of us, but we'd never set foot on this place. So our family hasn't been to this place for over 150 years. Um, this is a, a burial ground where Manahi actually said to us, our tūpuna, this guy called Whangatau, is buried. Uh, we, which we, were, we thought, well, we thought he would never be buried here because this is the, the realm of his sibling rivalry older brother. Um, but actually, uh, we realized he was here. Um, this place is where Colenso came and where he actually baptized hundreds of the people from this village. And um, how do we know this? Through his... Uh, diaries but how do I know this about Whangatauwa? It's through the minute books of a piece of land called Waikopiro so in the Waikopiro block of land the minute books are held by our families two of our families in Takapo hold all the minute books that were recorded in 1889 and the evidence given about this block of land and uh, so we hold the 1889 books the family up the road hold the 1891 court hearings evidence. And in this evidence, uh, two men, Enia Whangatauwa and a guy called Tanguru Tuhua. If you look up journal of the Polynesian, uh, the journal of the Polynesian Society, look up Tanguru Tuhua. He actually writes a number of uh, in-depth tribal histories of this region. Um, and in here, Enia Whangatauwa gives a, the evidence about his father, this guy called Whangatauwa, who we are descended from. Sorry, I don't have a photo for him, for him and I don't have a, an image of him because he was a little bit of a hermit. He lived in the forests, didn't like people, and uh, <laughs> for some reason, he got baptised. And um, so in here, his son speaks of his father as... Um, he has this term, kai kawe i ngāriri. He's the one who carries all of the anger of the tribes. He was a mercenary warrior. If you needed to deal with some people over there, you would come and see me, and I would deal to them and bring back the plunder, and you would pay me in land. Okay, that was his role. And he had about 10 big tribes around this region that he was the mercenary warrior that went to do war on their behalf, but he also went and did peacemaking on their behalf as well. Okay, so if you're going to be a general of war, you also have to be a general of peace. Okay, and uh, in this, he was known as quite a hard, brutal man. He fought in a lot of battles. He fought against Taropraha in the Battle of Waiorua, and on the way back home, they got defeated. He comes back and has another fight up the top of the Ruahine Ranges uh, <laughs> and then comes back to this forest land where he lived a lot of his life alone. Uh, when all of Ngāti Kahununu and the Wairarapa, many of those tribes during the musket wars, they left and migrated north to the Mahia Peninsula, Nukutaurua region for quite a few years. A few of these guys, like Whangatauwa, his cousin Tuhua, a number of tribal groups, they never left. They didn't abandon their lands because they stayed as the ahika on the land. So years later, the family started to drift back after Christianity started to speak to the chiefs and the warlords to bring them to a place of making peace permanently. So it was the Whakapono that caused the people to come back and people like Whangatauwa and them actually held their lands in those regions. In the land court minutes, uh, he becomes, he's a great gardener. 
hear gardens from all the way from Takapo down to Danivik. We know all the places. We know every rock that he uh, uh, lived under, every cave he lived under. We know all the names of his gardens, all the names of the houses on every parsite and mountain in that whole region because these guys recorded it in their evidence, in their knowledge. The genealogies of every rock, the genealogies of every place, who had the right to what land. And they're all in the minute books, but also held by families. And these, this guy, uh, Whangatoa, is mentioned a lot in those gatherings. He was also a teacher. At the time that the land, uh, people started to buy land, the settlers started to encroach on lands. There were land courts, hearings to be heard. He became one of the main teachers in a cave, near this land where they started to teach all of the young people the boundaries of their lands, the histories of the land, the cosmologies of the land, the mythologies of the lands, the whakapapas of the lands, who has a right to the land. They knew every tree, every river, every stream, every fish in the stream. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, so this one guy, who's an ancestor of ours, uh, he was very comfortable in his own culture. Okay, but in our family and maybe in some of the local tribes, if you mention his name, everyone goes, whoa, because he was quite a strong warfare man. But in the minute books, it says one line that he lived at Puehutai, he got baptized, and then he died. And that's the only line in it about Christianity. So my view was, we were sitting there going, how the heck did that happen? Why would a guy like this actually change his allegiance and get baptised? He was baptised under the Tohi regime to the god Tumatauenga to go to war, and that's who he was. The song sung for him was that he was to deal to those in, to avenge the deaths of ancestors. That's what his, bat his baptism was, actually a number of times, not just once, quite a few times. So now he's going to become baptised to a God he doesn't know, and to an, a new allegiance. And you've got, you got to ask yourself, why do they do that? What is that? What actually brought that about? And um, so we looked at it. If he died at Puehutai, you know he died... He's buried next to where this church that they built for Colenso was. And so we believe Colenso had a bit to do about this. So Colenso, we know him as a printer, printed thousands of copies of Māori language texts of the scriptures, the uh, common book of prayer, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. He, uh, he married uh, uh, Fairburn's uh, daughter, but then he ended up going to Napier to a mission station called Waitangi, and he walked for miles and miles over uh, between, say, 1843 to 1852, miles and miles walking all the way to Wellington, Napier to Wellington, through all of the tribal villages. And, uh, you know, I, I read some of his, his diary notes, and he uses words like heathen, <laughs> uh, docile, ignorance, all of these types of words which got my heckles up a bit, um, but as a Jesus-loving kind of uh, believer, I had to put, put all that aside to get to the truth, right? Um, otherwise, you stay in your woundedness and don't go anywhere. And uh, so, Colenso had strong relationships with the chiefs. Many of them he had fight a lot of conflict with, people like Te Hapuku, who's here, uh, Renata Kawepo, who's very famous. Um, well, all of these guys are famous. Kratiana Takamuana. And Ihai uh, Afakamairu, who's one of the chiefs from down in uh, uh, Wairarapa. All of these chiefs are mentioned in his diaries, everyday diary, in these as he goes to visit these villages over 12 journeys. Most of them had never met, many of the, them, like my ancestors, never met white people before until they met him. They had heard of this other God conversation, so they wanted to know what he had to say. Okay, so, um, Kalenzo happened to I think, he never made names, I haven't found my ancestor's name in the middle of uh, his diaries or anything, but maybe 
at some point, he got to hear. He got to hear this word. And uh, in his wars, he would have, uh, he had metal battle axes, so he understood uh, technology of the Pahia. He had been around certain areas in uh, Otaki and those regions, so he would have heard something of about Hadfield's mission. Um, but he was a wanderer and a hermit, this word mohoao. What's that word, mohoao? means like a wild bushman that lives in the bush. And, and that was him. He, he didn't like to come out into the open. Um, and so, but he must have come to Puehutai uh, in this village to live out his old days. And it was there we believe that he was baptised. Um, if I, I know I haven't got much time, but um, let me just um, read a few of the uh, uh, entries of Kalenzo's diaries when he goes to Te Puehutai, um, 20th of April, 1847, Aprehama and Ihakara from Puehutai, we're at Porangahau. So if you go from Danivek to Porangahau, it seems not far, but if you walk there, that's pretty major. So these guys are walking all through these villages, everywhere, they're everywhere, because they want to know what's going on. Their chiefs are sending them, they want to hear the gospel. Wherever Kalenzo went, they're all following. Okay, so he goes, he goes to Porangahau. Uh, on the 21st of April, he had 80 people at his morning prayer service. Um, <laughs> They built a new chapel for him, the dimensions of 40 by 24. Uh, there were big conversations with the chiefs about marriage. These are all new concepts to them, about the marriage of their children, the issues of land, the issues of government, uh, and also Te Rangi Hayata and Te Raupraha and what they're doing. All right. 1847, on the sixth journey of uh, Kalenzo into that region, on the 19th of November, he met at Puehutai amongst the assembly of chiefs. So every time he went somewhere, you'd always have the chiefs stand up, mihi, boyata, whakatau, and he would answer them back. His reo was very good, so he, he was able to answer them in te reo and converse very strongly with the people. The chief at Puehutai at that time was a man called uh, Ahiruanu uh, Te Kaimukupuna, who was the principal chief there. They had met in 1846 earlier. Uh, he gives chapel, was now the chapel there which had been previously built at Puehutai, but they start to decorate it. I don't know what the decorations looked like, but it had a bell. Um, there were big crowded gatherings. He preached on this particular day at his, out of 2 Timothy 2.4 to nearly 100 people. On the 20th, he ran catechist classes for 42 people. The people answered the simple questions and understood the simple tenets of Christianity. So you guys know better than me the whole, before you get baptized, you've got to learn all of these things, know how to read, know how to read the Bible, know how to be instructed by it, to do the catechisms before you can even get baptized. So all of these guys having to do this, even the chiefs, uh, to be able to be baptised. Um, and down the bottom of blue, I've just put here, 30th of March, 1848, he goes to Puehutai. There are big speeches by chiefs. Uh, he was speaking to 20 baptism candidates in the chapel. 134 came to the evening service. He preached from Hebrews 2.11. The next day, on the 1st of April, 22 baptism candidates were waiting for two years to get baptised. 16 of these people could read, several aged and some very old. 2nd of April, baptised 41 people with a crowd of 146, including the principal chief and his wife. In the afternoon of 144, 71 of these were for catechism class, on the 4th of April, we left Puehutai with 100 people on four canoes, which took six hours for us to get to the next village. 
He's busy. He's busy in the realm of discipleship, which we need to be. Right? He can speak Māori. He knows all of the chiefs. He knows all the people. We think in this realm is where Whangatoua got baptised. It's the very old and aged people. Um, I'm going to click really fast through a few things. We don't have his mind today. But if I look at a few characters, people like uh, Christian Rangi from here, what was he, what made him agree to be baptised? He had a number of issues. Um, maybe I'll put this here. Eternity. Who is your God? Is he real? Where does he live? That was one of his questions. Um, food. He does this funny thing where he grows two kumara gardens, one that's tapu to the Māori gods and one that isn't tapu to God. But it never gives what happened to the garden. <laughs> right? And, but the fact he's testing, to me, they're testing the bountifulness of God. Can your God give us the bounty required for, for chiefs to actually feed their people? Can he do this? So some of us are going to go home and plant two gardens. <laughs> right? Um, the idea of eternity, they needed to know that. And for me, what I wanted to talk, he says, I want to know where God is, and I want to know it, he's going to come to me. So what, is it, what happens to him? He has a dream. Jesus comes to him, takes him around heaven. He has this encounter. And then the next day, pretty much, he goes, okay, I'll get baptized because that's where I want to go. Then he got baptized and what happened? He dies. Right? To me, all of those ancestors went through that. The spiritual realm had to talk to them. Not just the words. Um, I've put here Taropraha. Um, maybe I'll just read this comment from his uh, son, Wiramu Taropraha's, wrote his own father's life story. And you know he's a warlord. My ancestors actually fought against him. Right? They, they were of that ilk. War was the world. And, uh, but in the end, if you read uh, uh, the uh, Kalman's uh, translation of uh, Wiramu Taropraha's life story of his father, you'll find this whole thing where his dad's in the ship uh, arrested by Gray in the hull of the ship, and he goes, tell my people that peace, not to seek a revenge for my capture. Go and tell them that I want peace for my children and the next generations. And I'm joyous in the hull of this ship as a prisoner. I'm in joy like that other guy, Paul, who is in a prison and chained up, and he's joyous and singing songs. I'm like him. And you got to go, Taropraha war, war Paul scriptures. Right? He, he's comprehending this. And he has a change of heart not to do war anymore. My ancestors in Naitahu, man, they were totally destroyed by him. If I went that way, we'd go, we'd hate this guy. Well, our families still hate him. Well, you can't say his name in our families. Okay? But he had a change of heart, and his son writes at the end of his father's life, he built Rangiati a church. Why? Because he had a vision of the heavenly realm that he wanted to go to. That's why it's called Rangiati, the great expanse of heaven. He didn't want to be in the earth anymore. And he says, his father, his son writes, what I have written down these concluding remarks about Taropraha de demonstrate that his heart was pure because of his believing heart, his nako whakapono. Although he was never baptized, that did not matter to him. He was baptized within his heart, and his death was very peaceful. He knew about the message of Christ when I asked him. And then, akamutu. Okay, I'll keep. This is what I reckon, my summation of this. Um, there's two guys, Te Ropiha and Mohi Te Atahikoya. Their fathers were contemporary warriors with my ancestor Whangatauwa. And in their writings, they are re recording all of their tribal histories. They do this. 
They validate their narratives by whakapapa. They validate their narratives by the songs, the ancient songs that hold the accounts of those uh, histories. They validate it by the proverbial sayings that are passed down from generation that speak to those histories. Okay? They also have a lot of supernatural stuff in those traditions. Um, I'd love to talk to you about that, have an academic supernatural meeting uh, sometime. <laughs> Um, but if you ask me, those, these chiefs were negotiating the narrative of the gospel. Not the man, not the church, not the institute, but the narrative of the gospel. They're trying to work it out, and they are actually, I reckon, they are gauging it by these things. Does it have whakapapa? Yep, the Bible's full of whakapapa. Most Bible people don't read the genealogies at all. Māoris do. We love genealogy. That's why a lot of our ancestors came to the Bible, because it validated the stories in the gospel. Even Jesus has a genealogy. So if the Messiah has a genealogy, and fuck a papa, then, wow, that must be valid. It's full of songs, 2,000-year-old songs, right? That recount the histories. It's full of proverbial aphorisms that speak to the validation of these things and it's full of the supernatural realm. So if you ask me, we've come right back to these questions, the same questions our ancestors were answering, asking, are the same questions this generation is answering. Well, who is this God? Where does he live? Is he going to turn up and show me himself? And I'm going to test him. Okay. So we are, to me, at this point, in a realm of testing. And we need to know how to answer the test. Well, actually, God can do it himself, right? And uh, so if I had to understand, this is how I understand, or we've come to understand, that guys like Whangatawa and Nahoka, all these, guys, these chiefs of that time, they loved Jesus. Man, they loved the gospel. They wanted to read and write. But why did they do it? Because out of their own tradition, it was validated, the narrative. And so... Our people want to follow the narrative, right? And we are, that's really the point of my talk today, is how do we ne negotiate the narrative of the gospel? Not all of the, well, I'll say it, academia around it and the institutes around it. So in saying that, that's all I want to uh, really share today. Nā rātou, nā tūpuna nei, i kōrero mai ki a mātou tēnei, e rā, Warato nei pātai, ki mato, me pēhe nei yahau, i whakahuri nei, ki te, te reo o te rongopai. Why did I turn to the rongopai? And so and that, I just want to uh, um, end off with that today. And thank you very much for the opportunity to um, share today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. amen.